we look at something in Baptist history, uh, and this morning we'll do that again. Sometimes uh, these stories are exciting and lots of action. Uh, this morning, not so much, but uh, I, I think there's some good things we can learn from uh, some things that happened or didn't happen in Massachusetts. But um, I guess uh, as, I, as I read historians, they say that, that not many uh, people have written, not, historians have not really written much about uh, Baptists in Massachusetts. And so they're just kind of taking bits and pieces from, from different areas. But um, when, um, from the landing of the Pilgrims, uh, for 40 years there was no, there, were no, there was no Baptist church in Massachusetts. Um, after, um, after that 40 years, a church, the first Baptist church um, that came to exist in the Commonwealth was actually a transplanted Baptist church from Wales. And that congregation, uh, led by Pastor John Miles, uh, they obtained a land grant um, from, uh, from the government, and they, and they came over to Massachusetts in 1667. Now, in 1734, so about 80 years um, beyond the, the landing of the, uh, 100 years beyond the landing of the pilgrims, um, that we have the Great Awakening. And we have um, this revival that sweeps through New England. And by that time, there were only nine Baptist churches in, in, uh, in Massachusetts. But from that time on, of course, we talked about this, but um, people began to question what was going on. Um, one of the uh, results of the Great Awakening was people realized that their church wasn't teaching the Bible uh, correctly. And so a lot of people began uh, looking at their Bible, reading their Bible, and they found a difference between what they read in their Bible and what was being taught at church. And so this agitation began to fester in the state church. Um, primarily, it, it began to fester over the issue of, of infant baptism and baptizing people that weren't, that weren't saved, of course. And so um, small groups began to meet in private homes to worship and discuss, discuss these things they were finding in their Bible. And that, um, that led to a lot of persecution. And the state church was, was really greatly threatened by, by that because they saw that as um, you know, people leaving the church. And so um, one, of the, one, one of the things, and, and, and people of note began to leave the church. And we talked about this man, I don't know if you remember this man's name, but uh, Henry Dunster, who was the president of Harvard, of all things, uh, he was reading his Bible, and he saw that infant baptism was not in the Bible, so he left the church and became a Baptist. Uh, he actually lost his job. They, they, uh, they fired him from being the president of Harvard over that. Uh, Thomas Gould was another, uh, another name that's known in, the, in this, I see a lot in these readings, but he was a, a, leading, uh, a leading churchman in the state church, actually, and these were two big examples. And so they started calling these people Anabaptists. They resurrected that term from uh, a couple hundred years previously in, in Europe. And of course, that was a, a term of derision, and Anna means non or baptizing well, baptizing again and that, so that was a term of derision they began calling these people anabaptists and um, oh i'll just read some things but um, the, the anabaptists in 1666 a group were presented to the grand jury and accused of absenting themselves from worship of course they declared that they were they were at a public worship meeting according to the order of jesus christ gathered together and some of these uh, phrases are old english so bear with me there but um Again, in 1666, warrants were given to constables to obtain the names of such Anabaptists as you will find met together. And that, from that time on, we began seeing this one name, and this is where I want to go this morning, but this, this man's name was Bananuel uh, Bowers. Um, kind of an odd first name, Bananuel Bowers. And his name begins to appear now over and over as one of these dread uh, Anabaptists. And um, so, for instance, a year later, um, there was a constable in Charlestown is required to warn Thomas Gould and his wife, Bananiel Bowers and his wife, for their persistency in not attendance at the public worship of God on Ye Lord's Day. So uh, the, his name begins to appear with these other names. Um, later he was uh, called in again, eventually was fined uh, and, uh, and imprisoned. But um, I could go and read a lot of these things here, but uh, I won't. I won't read uh, all these little court documents, but uh, he was brought into court from between 50, 1655 and 1682. The Bowers, both he and his wife, were brought into court at least a dozen times on various charges, including absent from worship, uh, turning their backs um, on an infant baptism at the state church. Um, 
And so his name appears over and over. He was publicly humiliated, he was beaten, he was imprisoned. Of course, he was fined, as I've said. Uh, he was called a ver vociferous and irascible, and he was a militant, called a militant separatist. Um, in one debate, Benaniel Bowers, who stood there in front of the court with his back all scarred from the beatings, um, he said that in his opinion, and this is what got him in trouble, these, these things that he would say, um, uh, in his opinion, um, he said that uh, the standing churches have only a form of godliness, and from such churches, God says we are to turn away. And obviously, this this led to him being singled out and and uh, and persecuted. But um, you know, this, the interesting thing about this Benaniel Bowers is this: as I as I researched him and just studied some more about him, and again, this is not exciting stuff, but I, I'm bringing this to a point here: is that actually, uh, Benaniel Bowers was a layman. Uh, his name appears more in these records than any pastor actually of these churches over and over he is he is standing for the right and standing for the lord and being persecuted for it he's a layman and what i learned from him was that he had deep spiritual convictions he he um he had a a, a great knowledge of the bible he had extensive memorization of the bible and um, god really used him and you know i i i say all this to say you know we're kind of this is kind of ho-hum we're used to religious freedom um we it kind of seems old hat um but, but I, I want to tell you something very quickly. We, um, I just became aware of last week, um, one, the, there's a human rights ordinance being voted on in Valparaiso, so the, the county seat, right, right to south of us. And uh, some of us live in Valparaiso. And um, in, studying that, in studying that document and looking at what they're asking you to do, of course, this is one of those documents that is anti-discrimination, uh, you know the bakers that were uh, didn't wouldn't uh, bake a cake for the homosexual wedding in Colorado, so they were shut down and fined because they wouldn't do that because of their religious beliefs. Well, that's this kind of ordinance is happening right in our backyard. I believe that Laporte is already passing or going to pass one. Um, some other cities in like Kokomo, uh, some cities like that in Indiana. But this ordinance, um, I was reading it, and as you read through the ordinance, one of the things there was a paragraph there that said. You know, people that have deeply held religious beliefs will be exempt from, from this ordinance. But it's all struck out and eliminated from the ordinance. Well, I dug a little deeper. I went to a, a newspaper article, and uh, in the newspaper article it said this, that they were discussing that, that people might have deeply held religious beliefs and be exempt from that. And this man on the, on the council said that including religious based exemptions could result in the ordinance being gutted, he said, because it's dangerous to, this is a quote, it's dangerous to exempt religious preference because anybody can make up any religion. That's what he said. So they have struck out now any religious exemption um, from that document, which means that if you don't want to participate, if you're a business owner and you don't want to participate in a homosexual wedding, or not even homosexual wedding, I suppose if you don't want to participate in a drinking party, serve, serve liquor at a drinking party, um, this this five-person uh, committee, who's not elected, this five-person committee can um, decide guilt and in innocence and levy fines and even recommend the police get involved. That's what's going on in, in Valparaiso. So that's being voted on, by the way, Tuesday night, if anybody's interested in going and voicing their difference to that. But, um, you know, we're used to the religious freedom. But we have to be so careful because I really believe it's being torn from us. And um, we, you know, some of us may be the next Benaniel Bowers that have to stand for the faith in front of the courts and, and uh, um, take the public humiliation and, and the, uh, the persecution. So we want to thank the Lord for these men that have come before us and really paved the way and kind of given us a, a road map of, of what that might look like in our lifetime. And so I think that it's not... Um, uh, it's not crazy to say that it's happening around us right now, and we need to be very careful. We need to pray for those that do. There are a few people in Valpo that are standing, a few council members. The police chief is a good man. He's trying to fight this, uh, you know, different people. But uh, I think we need to pray for those people because the, the intimidation is unbelievable, as you can imagine, of what's going on um, and the, the accusations, the intimidation. You know, everybody's tolerant. Uh, the liberals are very tolerant until somebody disagrees with them. Uh, and they don't realize that tolerance, you know, goes both ways. But uh, uh, so we need to pray for that, pray for our nation. Uh, it's happening all around us. And uh, we need to be vigilant on this matter of our religious freedom because I think it may be taking away, being taken away from us as we, as we, as we speak. So 
thank the Lord for this man, Ben Bowers, and his stand. I just wanted to bring that to you this morning. All right, Dutchess, if you'll come, we'll take.